afternoon. Welcome back. Would, would you all do me a small favor? Yeah? Th oh, thank you. Thank you. Would you, I know you just got settled, would you all just stand up and find a new seat, any seat but the one you're in? Perfect. Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much. I didn't see any fights, so that was good. And you were all successful at it. Of course, we're at Stanford. Now I'd like you to have a short conversation with someone nearby, maybe not the person you came with, or maybe it's them, 15 or 20 seconds on what allowed you to do that. What were all of the gestures and, and facial expressions and everything that happened, no matter how small, like you were a scientist, what did you notice that helped you to get to the new seat without getting into a fight? 15 or 20 seconds, talk to the people nearby. All right, great. Good. Give, give a little thank you to your discussion partner. Say thank you to your discussion partner. Great. So, you are all already experts at what I'm talking about today. So we're just a room full of experts. We're talking about power and the language of power. It's the secret language we all speak. Throughout that interaction, you didn't run into each other. You didn't fall over each other. You negotiated. Somebody had to decide who gives way and goes by and who doesn't. And there's a lot of smiling and nodding and head tilting that happens all throughout. I was watching, not every one of you, but I saw a lot of you. And that's what's happening. That is the secret language of power that we speak all the time. So. How many of you want power? Raise your hand nice and tall if you want power. Oh, yes. Yes, I teach in the business school and I know this. Yeah, we're <laughs> captains of industry. We want power. Not every hand, though. How many of you not really trying to grasp all that power and amass it? Hey, oh, there's the friendly, nice people. I see your smiles. Yeah. So we're kind of split. I think the more interesting question is why do we want power or why do we not want power? Because it has different meanings. Now, if we had a larger, huge, huge table, we could all sit around one big table and have a nice discussion about it. But since we can't, let me pull some discussion pieces from a few famous people. Contact with men who wield power and authority still leaves an intangible sense of repulsion. It's very much like being in the proximity to fecal matter. <laughs> now that is an opinion about power, and that some of you not wanting power might share some of that sentiment. But some people have a different opinion. I love power. <laughs> but it is as an artist that I love it. I love it as a musician loves his violin to draw its sounds and chords and harmonies. This guy loves power. He really wants it. But those are opposing positions. Like, how can it be that we love power and we hate power? Well, why are we averse to it? For one thing, people do not always acquire power for the right reasons. And right is a perspective, because your right reason to acquire power might not be the same as other people, so there's some discrepancy. But there are definitely people that pretty universally, we can say, try to amass power for the wrong reasons. 
because they often misuse it and it's not pretty. Now, we can go back in history and see some really terrible things that have happened when people have amassed power, but we can look in the paper today and see that that is still going on. There is struggle for power and there are negative consequences and that's part of why we're averse to it. We don't want anybody to have too much so they don't start doing bad things. And we believe in meritocracy, generally. We learn it in school. The right answer should be the thing that prevails. I mean, that's just right, isn't it? Somewhere deep down, we know that little third grader in all of us is like, no, that's not right. It shouldn't be that way. I, they have the right answer. So we, we kind of have an aversion to power. But at the same time, we also want power because we know we recognize there's a time when you need it, especially when that is in service of the greater good or someone else. And as a leader of people, an organization, a team, a group of children, whatever it is, there is a time when you need to wield that power in a way that helps to serve them. And I don't think we would disagree with wanting that kind of power, power to keep people safe, power to help them achieve what they want. Those are great uses of power. I think we would all sign up for, yes, I like power. I want it in that case. And we definitely covet status. We want people to respect us. We do everything we can to stay off the bottom and make sure there's at least that one person that's below. <laughs> there, there are videos and things that show the buckets of crabs where they're all clawing each other back down. Not really clawing their way up, but at least putting somebody below. And sometimes work can feel that way if it's not a great situation. But we definitely don't want to be the bottom. And we fight pretty hard. And it happens from a very young age. We start learning it in school, navigating this social hierarchy. And that's what we're talking about today. That first exercise you did of get up and move around and then have a discussion about it is part of a body of work that is in the class acting with power. So I'm a lecturer in the organizational behavior department, and there is an amazing team that I get to work with that teach this class. And we have all contributed the ideas I'm sharing today. What I can tell you is I believe all of them and with conviction, and I do this work all around the world. But that class works in the way that you just did it. We throw the students into an activity, an experience, where they're not quite sure why they're doing it or what's going on, it feels a little strange, and then we ask them to reflect on it. And then we come back and say, let's put some thought behind it. Let's pull some of the research and try to explain what's going on. Now, it's a beautiful marriage between art and science because the science says this is why it's happening. But the art side, the doing it in the experience, discovers the truths we all know and it lets us feel what's really happening so that we know it empirically and it's nice to know why. So that is what this class is about that I teach and that is what we're talking about today and what you are already experts in. Come on in and find a seat. Yeah, there's some right here. <laughs> great. No, no, it's fine. It's a great example because we all, they all know what you're doing now. <laughs> they all just got up and moved and changed seats. <laughs> Okay, so why do we have this love-hate relationship with power? Well, as we all know, when relationships are challenging, you have to have that define the relationship conversation. So let's have a definition com conversation about power. What is power? Power means a lot of things to a lot of people, and we use it in various ways. So if we're going to actually have some rigorous discussion about it, we define it. You do not have to adopt these, but for the sake of how we're talking about it today, these are how I'm going to talk about it. Power is the capacity to control resource and administer consequence. Pretty simple. Resource can be anything. It could be money, it could be time, it could be schedule, it could be responsibility, it could be friendship and social. You have power over someone when they depend on you for things that are important to them and in your control, or things that they cannot easily get other places. Parents control the candy. 
It is something that is important to the children and in the parent's control. And th the children, up to a certain age, cannot get easily on their own. But there's a balancing equation. Because children control the audible space in the house. <laughs> it is something important to the parents and in the control of the children, and that they cannot easily get other places because they have to stay and tend to them. So there is a balance back and forth. It shows up in every relationship. Authority, on the other hand, sounds like power. It's similar. It's in the same playing field. Authority is a characteristic of a, of a formal role. So the right and responsibility to control, direct, and dominate others. Here is your title. You are the vice president in charge of this. You get to control that. We officially mandate that you do. It's part of your role. It's your formal title. It is a basis of power, but it may give you control over resources. You may have seen a person or two who had the title but didn't really control resources. They're ineffectual. People don't listen to them. So it's not just authority. Hopefully, it's not too many of these people that are out there. But it does come up. But if that is not the only thing, if the title doesn't absolutely give you the control, there must be something else. And in social science, we call it status. This the extent to which others hold you in high esteem. Are you respected? And that is a way you can control resource. It's a condition of a relationship, and it's a basis of power. But people on an equal team, one person can lead that team, and everyone will defer because they're the known expert. Maybe it's the best football player, or the person who knows math the best in the study group and everyone will defer to them. They suggest that we run a play or that we study on this set of problems, and people will listen. They control the resource of what's happening. So power can be derived by authority or from status. That seems pretty simple. So there's our definition of the relationships there. One of these is not very much in your control. It's hard to give yourself a promotion. If you can do it, I recommend it. <laughs> Go ahead and do it now. But because you usually can't, you usually can't define it, you need help from other people, status is the one that we can play with. And that's the one totally in our control. That's how we interoperate and relate to other people. So we can get power just by changing who we are. And that, that's kind of a hopeful story as far as I'm concerned. Now, when we talk about power, controlling resources, it, we start, there, there's that love-hate thing that comes back in of who's controlling it and what are they using it for. So the goal of this work is to expand the authentic range in this equation of how you show up in your status with power, status, and authority because it's about improving relationships. communicating better. And as a leader, and the students that we have coming through here, we want them to go out and be effective and to lead and build good relationships. Now, you can use all of these tools that we're going to talk about for evil. They're just tools. You can influence other people. You can amass power, and you can use it for good or evil. But our contention is that if you can successfully navigate conversations better, if you can build relationships, improve them in how you operate with people, that you can change the world, you can change organizations, and you can accomplish your leadership goals and change the way you coach and you mentor and you facilitate and you lead. And that is a worthy goal in understanding the nonverbal communication and social hierarchies. At the end of the day, it allows you to show up in the way that your stakeholders need to need you to, your audience. And your audience is the people below you in the organization, the people on the team that you're trying to bring along, the nonprofit that you work with and you're on a board. How can you help to influence them, build a bond, get respect, and move things forward for the goals that you have? Because if your intention is good, we want to help you move along that, that route. So, so power.
I think this encapsulates the whole the whole idea I was talking about. The day that the power of love overrules the, power, the love of power, the world will know peace. That's a little higher than we shoot in the class. <laughs> but not too much higher, because change lives and change the world is in the motto. We really are about how can you, in your way as a leader, use love as the basis of leadership, which sounds a little funny. But at the end of the day, it's about people. And that is a nice principle to love can take a lot of forms. Love can be just in service. And if you can be in service of people as a leader and use these tools in that way, it's a very powerful place to be. OK. So this secret language we're talking about is universal. Can you tell which one is on top here? It's very clear. Does anybody think that this tiger leaning back is the one that's in control or in power? <laughs> right. Plain, 100%. Perfect. Good. Good. Quiz. Next, next question on the quiz. It scales to any size. So it doesn't really matter what size you are. Same thing here. Who has the power? Now, I'm a dog person, so I like this one a little bit better. But this is what's going on. There are is a whole language that is being spoken here. And I see this play out at the dog park all the time. There are books on wolf signaling that explain these things. And I will go and play with this, because it works across species as well. And it doesn't matter if you're young or old. That puppy is clearly dominant. He's so fierce, or she is. But this is how we learn it. Because at a very young age, we start playing with these tools, with our friends, with our parents. And we build these social skills. It's in the fabric of who we are and how we operate. This is how we communicate. And there's no intellectual study going on in this equation. This is just learning how do we respond to the world. And this is about relationships. The interesting thing is that this also governs our friendships. They're playing with status, who's on top and who isn't. But that's how you define a friendship. Friendships are the ones where you can play with this. You can put them down a little bit. You can call out. Like there's that story you know about your best friend that you keep trotting out, especially after a glass of wine. You're like, oh, well, what about the incident with the car? And everybody knows what that is. It's putting that person down and saying, yeah, you're a really bad driver. That's really what you're saying. But it's OK, because it's in this friendly and playful way. If you have a relationship with someone where it's n you've known them a long time, but they never felt like a friend, like it never hit that level, there's something different, it's probably that the status has never changed, that it's a, a static condition. So it scales. We learn it when we're young. It goes cross species. And not just cross species there, but cross species here. So this is universal stuff that we're talking about. It's dominance and submission. So there is no, oh, that's not how it works for me. Or I'm from this region of the country or this part of the world, so we don't operate in that way. This is really basic. How it shows up has cultural differences, to be sure. And it's not about age. And this is just gratuitously cute. <laughs> but that little girl is the one who's dominant over that dog, who clearly is a more powerful animal in that equation could cause harm, but doesn't. It's giving respect. That is, that is status. This is showing it in esteem. And it pretty much all comes down to who bites who. If you are high status or coming in with that dominance, you're saying, stay away or I will bite you. And if you're submissive, you're saying, don't bite me. I'm not worth biting. It's pretty simple when it gets down to the, the basics. All right. You can imagine your favorite or least favorite politician here. I wanted to stay pretty neutral on this, because I have no idea who's who in the audience. So you will see it in politics all the time, though. We are at a really interesting part of time where over the next year, and it's already been going on for a year, but over the next year, we are going to see the debates and a ton of press going on around the political election. 
And there is so much that happens in there that you can watch this. If somebody does the handshake wrong, adds the extra arm grab, doesn't do the handshake, or does a toast where they don't look at each other right, it's 24 hours on CNN. It's 24 hours on CNN because it means something to all of us. It's not up there not because we don't understand it. It's up there because we do understand it. It says something, and it says something very clear, and it's this language of power. So it's going on all the time. OK. Anybody know what this is? Someone walking? Huh. Technically, it is 16 dots. <laughs> but the 16 dots do come from a person in a black suit with light bulbs on them that they record. In fact, this is the aggregate of 300 people doing that. 16 dots of information is a very, very small amount, but you all saw a person. I've never heard anything other than that, but I suppose there could be a dog upright, perhaps. But it's a person. You're really good at this because somewhere along the line, evolutionary biology said, you better be good at recognizing humans and taking stock of what they are, who they are, are they friend or foe. So we can recognize it very easily with not a lot of information. So just imagine what you get from all 88 muscles that show up here and all that extra information. Gestures, all of that comes in. OK, so if that's a person, what about that? A soldier, what was that? A male? Oh, a man. Oh, OK. Well, what about this? <laughs> no one ever laughs at the man. <laughs> Everyone laughs at the woman. I don't know what that is, but uh, here they are together. They are definitely different. What do you notice as the differences specifically? What was that? Sorry, a little loud. The hips move on the one on the right. Yeah? What else? The feet are closer together on this one. The knees are? What was that? Ah, the head moves le less back and forth on this one. Oh, on that one. Interesting. The shoulders and arms are more aggressive on this one. And the arms are moving more? Oh, and they're moving opposite. Interesting, huh? So these are also averages and then tuning out certain characteristics. There's a tool that they have that you can move some sliders. And this is moving the male and female slider to the extremes. So some things that you pointed out, like the feet are very together on this one, and the arms are a little more in, and the hips move. Six and seven-year-old girls do not work, walk this way, not in general. And neither do female athletes going out to play soccer out here. right? This is learned behavior. right? This is something that we adapt to for very particular reasons. There is a lot of signaling and cues that go on to this in what it says, but it is a learned behavior. It's not innate. Turns out, like 9 and 10-year-old boys do not have any kind of muscle mass that requires their arms to, walk, to be out like this. <laughs> but that's when they start to move their arms. They're mimicking. So we are being trained to become what these are, this, mas this version of masculine and feminine from a very early age. I don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong with that, and there's definitely some, some biology reasons behind that. And you know, the muscles do fill out for most, some, some people, I guess. Um, and, uh, and 
In high heels, I think this comes up even a little bit more, but some other kinds of shoes, when you're out power walking, it doesn't happen as much. So it's something that we don't always do, but it is a, a certain piece of how we start to learn this language of power. What is the, what's the right thing for me to be and how I show up in a different context? And I, I'm not advocating that it should be any way one or the other. And there is clearly, in this work, a couple of things that are very deep holes that we can just go down into for a long time. This could all be about gender, and we've got some really good data about gender, but I want to keep it just a little bit up out of that particular one for now. I avoided politics, I think, rather nicely as well. So here's different. This is not male, female. What do you think of this one? Michael Jackson. <laughs> I have never heard that, but I love it. What else? I'm going to start that one again. Happy? Running. Power walker. Ah. Determined? With purpose. OK, what about this one? The right side is always funnier. I don't know why. <laughs> what about this one? Suave. What was it? Suave. Suave. Yeah. Suave. <laughs> I'm pretending like I know what it means, too. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm not suave. They're different, yeah? Well, that one doesn't know how to walk. They Yes, yeah. They are moving their knees a little like this. <laughs> but that, I, I, I think that is a function of the averaging, not any one individual. But that is, that is true. So this one, the slider that gets moved is uh, nervous and relaxed. So nervous has energy. So power walk, I think, lines up with that. They didn't have power walk on there, but they had nervous and energy. And then, as it turns out, you can rotate and watch from the side. Now, during this one, I am dynamically am moving the sliders. I'll, I'll narrate it. This is normal. And then I slide to male. And then I slide to female. Yeah, longer try, you can see the hips that, that swing from the side as well. Interesting, huh? I have heard more than once that part of the reason of this and the angle is the high heels. Is that, is that true? Yes? Yeah, that is true. That bears, out, that bears out in my research, which is informal, but almost every audience tells me that. So we're very good. All of your observations, accurate, for sure. It looks like something, and we're good at recognizing what it is. This is all that language of, of power that is the secret language going on all the time. Hopefully, you're, you're recognizing this and going, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. This isn't new. Like, you go to a cocktail party, circle of people, and someone approaches. And the circle usually does one of two things. It opens up, and it lets them in. Or it closes ranks, and it doesn't. And that is the same thing. It's about con who, who are we protecting? Are we going to allow and share our power? And just one person in that group can sort of own the space and the power that they have and invite them and say, come, join us, and bring them into their space and, and part of the circle. So we can act individually as agents and change this equation and affect relationships. But it's something that's familiar. And we know it. We learn it the hard way in junior high school primarily. There's a lot of social dynamic, and we try and experiment and fail, and it's a lovely, awkward, awful time. Um, but it's where we sort out most of this. And then we sort of get set, and we learn our way. This is how I navigate the world. And we're somewhere on the spectrum from this sort of powerful, high place to this low and more approachable place. This is the, uh, the reference for this. It's a university in Canada. And uh, th so we can see male and female, we did heavy and light, nervous, relaxed, happy, and sad. And it's just pulling averaging out um, 
they have, they have a lot more information if you're interested to go and dig in on that, the BioMotion Lab. So, your turn, let's try this. Think about the day of the month that your birthday is on. For me, it's the 7th of July, so my number is seven. Think what your number of the month is. If you are an even numbered day, you're gonna be team blue. Just remember I'm team blue right now. If you're an odd numbered person, you're gonna be team green. Just remember that you're green. Blue and green. And if you forget, just pick one, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but I wanted about half and half. All right. I'm gonna ask you, you don't have to move, uh, you don't have to change positions, but if you would stand up, because I want you to be able to look around. <laughs> You're getting off easy, by the way. This, our classes are a lot more active. I was trying to, trying to give you a nice soft re-entry into your schooling, so. <laughs> All right, Team Blue, I want you, I'm gonna ask you to I'll give you the whole thing and then we'll do it. So Team Blue, I'm going to ask you to look around and you're gonna make eye contact with people for about 10 seconds. Team Green, you'll be doing the same thing. But Team Blue, when you make eye contact with somebody, you're gonna hold comfortable eye contact for about 10 seconds. And then I'll say switch and then you'll find someone else and you'll hold comfortable eye contact with them for about 10 seconds and then you'll switch. You are not going to psychotically stalk someone. <laughs> or go after them or like climb across and try to, none of that. Just as I'm talking to you right now, it's comfortable for me to hold eye contact for this long. It's not terribly long, but it's a little long. Okay, that was team blue. Team green, you're going to also make eye contact, but as soon as you do, you're gonna break it somehow and then you're gonna reacquire it and then you're gonna break it again and reacquire it as many times. Just break and release and break and release your eye contact. You can move your eyes, you can move your head, whatever you want, but like they're not gonna be psychotic staring down, you're not gonna be like, look, and look away, <laughs> and look, and look away. It's not like playing around with this, it's just like look and break eye contact and then look, and then you're gonna break it and look, and are they, sort of checking, are they still looking at me? If you match with somebody, two blues together or two greens together, just stay with it. So you'll look and you'll meet somebody and yep, it's us. And you know that moment of us and then you start doing your behavior. And it's, uh... okay, it's whatever it is. All right, you ready? Turn and look for somebody, 10 seconds. Hold that behavior, look or look and look away. Great, switch, someone new, they might be across the room. Good, switch. Okay, good, look up here for a second. Great, nice. So interesting to watch. There's something here, right? Yeah, so switch behaviors. Whatever you just did, do the opposite. If you were look and look away, you're just gonna look and hold comfortable, don't go psychotic on us. And if you, or literally or figuratively, although literally means figuratively now. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, and if you were looking and looking away, now just comfortably hold eye contact. 10 seconds, find someone, go. And switch. And switch. Okay, good, good. Have a seat and a short discussion about what you noticed. Huh? No, nobody wants to look at me. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right.
So there, there is something going on in that, isn't there? Eye contact, turns out, means a lot to us. And that's a pretty extreme version of it, to just look and hold. It's a pretty extreme. There's a point where it gets, yeah, uncomfortable, <laughs> right? I'm blinking, yeah, yeah. Really good actors, of which I am not, have trained themselves to not blink at all. Clint Eastwood never blinks. And that's, his characters tend to be very powerful. That's part of this. So this equation of looking and holding, we would call that high status in, if we drift a little from the social science into the theater world, we would call it high status. And that is being more authoritative, more powerful. The looking and looking away would be more approachable. So it's authoritative versus approachable is, is the scale I think we're playing with. So if there, there are a set of other behaviors that go with them. And notice what, did you notice what your body was doing when you had the eye behaviors? Did anybody see that? Any observations? Yes. She said, when I was looking and looking away, I almost felt like I was flirting with the woman in front of me. <laughs> that is no coincidence. Flirting, it, it, I mean, this is another area that we're going to go lightly over. But it for sure shows up in the dating world of what flirting means. And looking and looking away can be just nervous, but it can also be something else. <laughs> right? And the fact that you're all laughing means you know how to read this. I told you you were experts. So it's learning to navigate that. So for sure, it can feel like flirting or it can feel like nervousness. How we come across to each other. You, did anybody start to come up with a little narrative or a little story about who that person was or what they were like just based on the eye contact? Anybody? Yeah? Yeah. It, it just happens. If someone shows up in a in a way with certain set of behaviors, after a while, you, you just start to ascribe that's the kind of person. As it turns out, and this is not great news for smart people like yourselves, it's not about what you say. It is about how you say it. And that seems unjust in a way, uh, but it's true. And it does explain some of our political landscape. There are people who just say it in a way that people are attracted to. And there are people on both sides of all of the possible aisles that you could think of that it's true for. But it's why we do see people coming from Hollywood and actors that end up doing quite well because they are really good at this equation. So, okay. It is not what you say, it is how you say it. It's almost like I knew we were going there. I would like you to, from your seat, pick one of these two quotes and just read it out to the world, to me, either one. Go ahead and do that now, please. Great. So um, whichever one that you did, just sort of stick with that. We're going to play with this a little bit. Um, now I want you to read it, but slightly differently. I want you to read it in a way that how you say it adds to the meaning. For instance, I could say the right word may be effective, but no word was ever as effective as, the right, as a rightly timed pause. That's reading it. But the right word may be effective, but no word is as effective as a rightly timed pause. That adds some meaning to it by just how I say it. It's different, yeah? Your turn. Pick the same one. Read it in a way that you, it enhances meaning. Go ahead. Nice. <laughs> the music of that is different. Like from here, I can hear it all together. But it's much more interesting and nuanced. So lovely. You're great. OK, this is either going to be the most fun or the worst part of this lecture. 
This is the last time I will ask it, but please rise. Again, I know. Our students do complain slightly sometimes about this, but then end up loving this part. So it, it's fun. I'm going to invite you to all just to go into the fun of this one. So I'm going to ask you to read these again, but I'm going to give you some archetypes that you're going to read them in. I will demo them first. I'm not going to ask you to do anything I won't do. You do not have to do it quite as big as me. I'm going to go for it to try to open things up for you. But you're going to read these four times as different characters. The first one is going to be as the rock star. <laughs> you're physically bold and aggressive and energetic. Vocally, you're loud, you're intense, and you're musical. <laughs> and your presence is legendary, iconic, narcissistic, and shocking. <laughs> Read your quote as the rock star. Go! <laughs> uh, I may have the best job in the world. <laughs> That was phenomenal. Wow. I am going to shame our MBA students with your enthusiasm and say, you've got to at least do as good as the alum did. All right, now, read your quote as the preschool teacher. You're physically light, flowing, exaggerated. You're vocally you use long vowels. You're expressive. You're enunciated, you're soft, and you're sing-song. <laughs> and your presence is friendly and nice and condescending. <laughs> Preschool teacher, go. Before there was an uprising of preschool teachers rushing the stage, my mother was a preschool teacher, and I, I've gotten approval for this. This is a stereotype. It is not who you really are. I know that. OK. We don't want angry preschool teachers on stage. OK. Now read it as royalty. You are graceful, formal, still and flowing physically. Vocally, it's understanding and respectful, articulate and lyrical. And your presence is regal, grounded, elevated, and majestic. <laughs> Royalty. <laughs> wow. OK, last one. You are the motivational speaker. <laughs> you physically are dramatic and precise. You are energetic and expansive. Vocally, you are positive, dynamic, emphasized, enthusiastic. You can do it. <laughs> and your presence is connected and divine, messianic, and up Lifting. Go. Yeah. All right, give yourselves a big round of applause. Go ahead and grab a seat. Well, I was doing all four, wasn't I? There's a request that he wants to hear all four of them. For time, I'll do the last one as a quote. The right word may be effective, but no word was ever as effective as a rightly timed pause. You can do it. OK. <laughs> they are. DVDs are on sale in the uh, lobby. And uh, go to richmotivationalspeaker.com.
Maybe I should. Wow. <laughs> so uh, we have a few more that we go through with the students. And then we hand out cards with these images on it. Half of them say a bigger version of you. And it's just physically more of you, vocally a little bit more of you, and your presence as full as you can be. And they secretly, they get up in front of the class and we guess, what were you? And if you are a bigger you and people say, rock star, royalty, you're like, oh. <laughs> and if you get up and you're rock star and people are like, a bigger you, you're like, oh. <laughs> in either case, they find out a lot about how do they show up to the world? What's their natural place? And we all have one of two of these that are a little more comfortable, one or two that are a little less comfortable. I went easy on you, I didn't, we have one that has a, a fairy with like a little wand that's all loopy and circular that's fun, but I, I, I'll save that for next year. Um, but it's about, can you align what one of these archetypes that's in you with whatever message you're trying to deliver? That's the real key. We're all, all of these, for sure. But. If you're stuck in one and you can't get to the others, your choices are limited by your experience, how you, uh, how you were raised, all of those experiences, and how you navigate the world. And if you decide, I've got to be really authoritative today, but you can't go there, it limits your choices. So we, we're trying to expand the range so you can go and make the choice you want. Because nobody wants to hear, we're having layoffs. <laughs> right? That, that persona does not match with the message. <laughs> Maybe something more like royalty is going to be better in that case where it's more gravitas. But <laughs> there's another one that's general, and I don't want to walk up to a niece and go, happy birthday, <laughs> and frighten her. It's what's the, what matches the message, and we all have this wide range. But everybody's motivational speaker is different, and everybody's general and rock star they're all their version of it. We're talking about acting now because this class is acting with power. And we've done some of the social science, but this is the acting part. And acting is not about pretending. That's a really common mis misconception. Acting is about finding the truth. When you see people on television that are bad actors or in movies that are bad actors, and you can tell it's because they're pretending. The people that are really amazing actors are finding the truth. And we know from the Stanford Prison Experiment and other similar things that we've got all of it in us, including the bad stuff. And we know from everyday people who do amazing, heroic things that we've got the light in us too. It's just part of the human condition. Right circumstances will all do anything. So given that, we can access anything. And a really amazing actor can play an evil, horrible person doing terrible things and then show up as the like, wonderful father or mother in the next one, and they'll both feel very truthful. So we're not talking about being inauthentic, about amassing power and being like, I'm being powerful now, right? This is powerful. This looks cartoonish, right? That's not really powerful. Really powerful is can you be still and comfortable in a moment where you're having that pause that's so effective? That's much more powerful than the puffed up and all of that. So it's about finding that truth. And it's about being fully present and in the moment right now. So mindfulness and yoga are getting sort of popular in the, the business realm. It's for good reason. As a leader, you can show up and deliver that message with an authentic version of how you want to be with the right level of authoritativeness or approachability. Because you come in too high on authority and scare people away and they won't talk to you and you don't get the information you need. So maybe you need to move a little over on the, the more approachable side. But if you're always like this and you're, you get people to do things by being nice and they want to do it for you, when it's that time, you have to stop doing that. You need to be able to go to that range as well. So you got to be fully present in the moment with people. And you have to move off of yourself and focus on them.
So it ends up being not about you. It's about connecting with the other person and showing up in the way they need you to show up to communicate and build those relationships. And it's also about listening and connecting. This is starting to sound good. Like what if everybody that you interacted with was their authentic version of themselves always in the moment. They were really fully present and they listened and connected. Like, I want to live in that world. That's a good set of stuff. And that's what acting can, can offer you. So am I saying go take an acting class? Yes. <laughs> I am saying go take an acting class. It's a great place. Or an improv class. That's where I kind of came up through improv. It, you can go and play with all of this stuff and experience it. And it's fun. And you'll learn something about yourself. Because it works outside in and inside out. If you change your body, it will change how you feel inside. There's a good TED talk by uh, Amy Cuddy about power poses. It's pretty popular, people seen that, yeah? Yeah, expand your body and you will feel more powerful. Backstage, before I came on, I was back there doing this. <laughs> I had some good music on, I have uh, ultimate epic uh, movie themes in Spotify, and I listened to that. <laughs> Plug for Spotify, I guess. Um, but I listened to that, and it makes me feel better. I listened to it all the way down as I was driving here today, and then expanding my body, because I wanted to show up in this way with enough energy to muster motivational speaker and rock star in front of you. <laughs> but the same thing works the other way. When you're feeling something, it shows up in your body. When you did that, eye contact experiment, I saw lots of people shift. The first one, they were looking and looking away and their bodies caved in and they were more like this. And then they got the other one and they're like, hmm, right? And so how you feel shows up in your body. So you can use that as an indicator. If you notice that you're all folded up, you know what's going on. You can change that by expanding your body and change how you feel. It's sort of like when you're, when you're young and you're a little upset, and you get go outside and play, it's because you get your body into motion and your emotions change as a result of that. Here's the quick summary of everything I've said. If you want to be more authoritative, there's five S's. Slowness, stillness, oh sorry, silence, space, stillness, and symmetry. Slowness in how you move and walk, Silence, We've, that pause encompasses that. Space is about the space that you take up and what's yours and whether you invade someone else's. Stillness is just limiting the motion. And symmetry means this, not this. This is asymmetric. And I would say this is a little bit less powerful but more approachable. And this is a little bit more authority and gravitas and maybe a little less approachable. So the more you do it, the, the less powerful you look. And, uh, and as I start to go a little faster with this, we move into the Fs. So fast, if, you, if you're always trying to get your words in, just so you don't get interrupted. That getting your words out fast because you're afraid somebody will interrupt is a lower status place. You have to fight for it. If you're powerful and you're a place of power, you know they're going to stop talking and you're going to keep going anyway, so they better stop. That's a different, <laughs> right? That's a, the other side of this. If you have to fill silence, you cannot stand there to be an empty space. That's more on the approachable but lower status side. Giving space, if anyone can give me a word that starts with F that means giving space and getting out of the way, I would love it. But for now, that F is give space. <laughs> Fidgeting, um, especially if you touch your face or, or you know, just those little gestures or anything you do is a little more low status. And folded, that's the, that's this, that's sort of protective and any kind, any, any kind of folding. That's all lower status. So it's more approachable. It's people can and will walk up to you if you do these. And they will stay away if you do the others a little bit more. These work. Don't play recklessly late night on public transit or BART or things with these. 
because people do react to this stuff. And if you, if somebody is acting tough and a little crazy, and you come on with that authoritative, it goes to confrontation. So you know, be a little careful. And, and this is generally toward the end of the school year. There's a lot of questions about how should I use this in interviews. And it is not be authoritative, put on all these things, and get on that motivational speaker and go in. That is not it. It is about being comfortable and playing with this stuff until it's in your toolkit and it comes out naturally, and then making the strategic choices of how you want to show up. And the baseline rule that I generally say for interviews uh, for them is match and go just below. You're worth talking to, but not threatening. And that's a pretty good thing. If you just want to connect with somebody, just sort of copy them physically and vocally. And you'll come in at a pretty even level. Forfeit space. Winner. Yeah. Thank you. Yay. I learned something too. OK. Uh, I'm going to close with this. This is my niece, Danielle. She is super fierce. I love her. This uh, is her first day body surfing, and she is not going to let go of that board. She ends up being a little bit more on the authoritative side. She takes after my sister, who's two years older, and I know this really well. I see it happening. And when I was young, I saw my sister as bossy. And I know that's not the best word anymore. What I see now is leadership skills in my niece. And she's good at it and I help encourage it. The problem is Brady. <laughs> and he's the same age younger than me and my sister. And this is him trying really hard, that finger outstretched and taking up, it's invading her space, desperately trying to assert his authority. But can you see on his face that it's not really there? <laughs> He knows it's coming, and so does she, because look at that expression. I can't tell you the muscles that do it, but I know the expression is she is about to take that away from him, and I watched it happen because I took this picture. <laughs> he tries, but he is on the uh, more approachable side of the world, <laughs> kind of like his uncle. One of the things that comes up in this work a lot is people say, should I be more authoritative or more approachable? And they tend to think high power, and that's the way to go, what we want. But he's not wrong. Brady is just fine. And so are you if you're on the approachable side. And so am I. It's not that there's a right or a wrong. We want the most range. And you have found your place, your comfort zone, and that is a great place to be. And if you can stretch and find a few more places that you could go one way or the other, it might help you navigate a few relationships. But everybody is OK on this, uh, especially Brady. <laughs> so. I don't, I didn't have, I didn't get that picture. But, but it happens enough I could go get it this weekend. <laughs> the thing that I like about this is we learn it when we're young. They're already experts, so we already know it. So hopefully that I've said that enough that you know, and you will now see this everywhere. You have a great opportunity with all these cocktail parties and things you're going to and events. Just step back for a while and watch it all happen. People reaching in and invading space and putting an arm around, and all this stuff is going on. So that's one thing. The other is that there isn't a right or a wrong, that both ends of the spectrum are great. And, uh, and it's about relationships. It's about they really do get along very well because they navigate this. They're figuring it out, and they're going to be OK. It's a secret language that we all speak. Thank you. Do we have? OK, good. So we do have a couple minutes. If you have any questions, we have some mics. You can come on up. We're going a little into overtime. Can you show that one slide that we did 
Yes, I can. Yes, I can. I'd like to ask you, uh, uh, um, what we're talking about is body language, and yes. there, are, there are people who feel body language is uh, m more effective. I mean, 50, 60, I have one scientist friend who says 70%. Mm -hmm. What about all of the communications that's going on without the bodies? The texting, the mm. you don't pick up any of the meanings, the feelings, the yes. this. Yeah. Okay, so with online email, texting, that kind of communication and chat, yeah, there's, there's no body language involved. We've tried. I think it's why we have emoticons, sure. right? It's trying to insert, because we're desperate for that other information to come in, so I think we try in that way. But it definitely affects the communication. Uh, and we see, I mean, if you've been online at all, it's just a lot of arguing and positional stuff. And I think it doesn't happen when you put two actual people in a room because there's a more fluid communication. I think the relationships in person are better than they are online. I have grandchildren who feel if you're not texting, you, that, that's it, you text. Don't bother to call. I yeah. mean, because that's old fashioned. Yeah. Don't say, I want me to sit down and talk. I mean, it's like, it's texting. Yes, I know. I so know. we're losing something. We, I think we are losing something. I think we are. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Class of 65. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> Would you talk about power at the species level? How is it that our species has got this notion that we are the most powerful on the planet, and by golly, we deserve it, and we can get away with whatever we want? And mm. Is that a problem, and how do we deal with that? <laughs> yeah, we can applaud that. Yeah. Uh, I think demonstrably it is a problem. There are plenty of problems that are caused by that. Uh, and I think it's part of why we are averse to power is because we as a species tend to consume, take, and, and like use up all of the resource. Uh, I don't know what we can do specifically about it. Uh, I think from this work, Hopefully, relationships and building better relationships is one of the keys to it, because we have to work together. We're, we're quickly growing to the point where there's not much left, and we're going to have to work together, and I think this is one key to it. I go all over the world teaching and, and working with this, and it's the same. It's universal. This space, when we talk about space and invading space, it's different in different cultures. How much space is okay to be uh, between you is different. But what's universal is if I cross that line, whatever distance it is, that's dominant. So there are some universal things, and I think it can help improve our communication. But I wish I had uh, uh, a save the, mess save the world message for you. Yes. Rich, when you're talking Hi. about, how you doing? When you're talking about uh, authoritative, you mentioned uh, taking up space mm -hmm. and also being silent. And I'm wondering about the, um, it's, there's this, an apparent tension that sometimes people who are authoritative take up vocal space. Oh, yes. And can you say a little bit more about how those two work together? Yes. I think space works physically and vocally. Uh, people that dominate a conversation and don't leave room, that's an act of dominance and power. Um, I was just watching... Uh, uh, Bill Maher's television show, and there was a woman set between two men, and the one on the left was incredibly dominating, interrupted her so many times, and she did some beautiful moves uh, in the middle of doing it to help affect that. One, he started talking, and she just put her hand out and rested it on his arm and left it there until she stopped talking, and it shut him up. It was a very subtle, but it was like, it was dominating. It was just like that cat paw on there <laughs> um, to do that. And the second one is she started talking, and he interrupted, and she said, oh, you know where I'm going? <laughs> and then let him go. And she kind of claimed the vocal space that this is my idea, but I'll let you say it. And so I thought those were really, really evolved and nice ways of dealing with that situation, because it comes up a lot. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go over here and then I'll come back. Yeah. 
I know you didn't want to get into the gender stuff. Yes. But I have to ask if you have any thoughts, insights, interesting research about the negative consequences of power in women. Mm, yes. Uh, look at me distance myself. <laughs> wow. That's what I mean. You can watch your own body language and realize what's going on. Okay, let me step into this. Um, so uh, I get to, I'm lucky enough to teach with Professor Deb Runfeld here, and she has some fantastic research uh, about gender in this. She's working on a book, so there's going to be more soon. One of the things is that there is a warmth competence gap for women, that the perception of men and the perception of women on men is that the warmer they are, the more competent they are, and the more competent they are, the warmer they are. The perception of both men and women on women is that the more warm they are, the less competent, and the more competent, the less warm. And that is not a great uh, piece of data that we have, but it is a true piece of data. It's observational and not prescriptive. But, uh, and I think this is not news to uh, the women in the room. Like, have you experienced this? Yeah, yeah. So. What can we do about it? Society has to change for that gap to close. But with this, having the widest authentic range and being able to be fluid across it and make choices, I think is the best way of doing it. It turns out it's the best thing for men as well. Uh, but that is the most effective, is to be dynamic in that. Um, the, the trap that... Uh, that, ha that came up sort of in the 80s and 90s was thinking you have to make a choice. And it's like, well, I'm going to make my career path and I'm going to be competent and I don't care what they think. And that, that is, it's a valid choice and you, know, you can go with that, but I think it doesn't have to be so one end or the other. So that's a piece of it, one of the, one of the ones we have most data on. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, great. So I'm taking that um, it's good to be fluid and to be able to uh, move in different spectrums. But if we find ourselves, let's say, at low status, low warmth, weak and repellent, mm -hmm. is there a, I'm okay, you okay, is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> They're all okay. It's what is the relationship and how do you want to cross and does it match with what you're saying? Where I think this shows up is, Sometimes we're just unaware of where we're showing up or how we're showing up. And it can be as, as simple as you walk in a bad commute and not feeling that great, and you can be sort of down, low, and cold. And that's what you're putting off. And if you know that that's a possibility, then when you hit the door, you can say, is that how I want to show up? And it's OK to go, yep, I feel terrible. Just stay away. <laughs> and go ahead and do that. But you can also. Stop at the door and go, OK, it's an important meeting. <sighs> I'm going I'm to put this on now. And by putting it on, I'll start to feel it and go and have that moment. So making choices. Um, this is a little generalized. There's a, there's a large, nuanced conversation. The main idea is that there's authoritative and approachable, but there's also warm and cold on both. So yeah, thank you. Yes, last one. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, can you uh, take Roosevelt, Churchill, Reagan, Bill Clinton, and tell them and tell us where you would place them in the in the? <laughs> that in, is a in, great question, and actually, that is what we do with this in our classes. We get from the students who's in the these quadrants and go through them, and those names frequently come up. Uh, Oprah comes up up in that top one as well often, so. Um, I, I would be guessing on a few of those because I'm an organizational behavior lecturer and not a history one. Um, okay. So I don't know the depth of them, but powerful leaders tend to be on the higher side. And then they, they vary from warm to cold. Um, I would say Bill Clinton is on the warm side. <laughs> uh, and Vladimir Putin is on the colder side. <laughs> So there, there is a range. Both leaders, both powerful, both got things done. So uh, that, is, that is another piece of this is 
Again, neither one is right. You can be a leader and be authoritative and cold, and you can be a leader and be more warm, and they both work. So, Speaking style, royalty, you know, uh, motivational speaker in that grouping, uh, any easy placement of those presidents? Generally high status, and I would say varied on warmth. Um, Churchill's a little before me, but my, the images and things that I have seen seems a little cold, seems a little on the cool, cooler side and more stoic, so. Uh, it might be more royalty, yeah. Yeah, great, thank you. Thank great. you, Emily.